Welcome to the quantum realm, a place where the impossible thrives. Sci-fi fans and explorers, this is your gateway. We're diving into the unknown. Hit subscribe and join the mind-bending journey. The sterile white lights of Labo 3 flickered above me with an almost mocking intensity. The scent of ionized air and ozone clung to my nostrils, a constant reminder of the ceaseless hum of machinery that surrounded me. My fingers, usually nimble and precise, felt clumsy as I adjusted the neural interface harness for what felt like the hundredth time. Beside me, Commander Thorne sat unnaturally still, his weathered face drawn taut. I knew he hated needles, hated the invasion of the neural probes, but he said nothing. His eyes, sharp and flint-colored, were fixed on the gleaming form of the first prototype raven suspended in the center of the chamber. Are you ready, Silas? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. He gave a curt nod. As I'll ever be, Doc. For Earth. And for Emily, he added, his voice softening on his daughter's name. A surge of bittersweet emotions washed over me. Emily Thorne was a brilliant pilot, lost in the first wave of the Krenyari onslaught. I had known her, not well, but enough to see the flicker of her father's spirit in her eyes. We'll honor her, I said, my determination outweighing the tremble in my voice. With painstaking care, I initiated the imprinting sequence. The neural interface flared to life, thin tendrils of light snaking out to link Thorne's mind to the complex systems. Data flowed in torrents, faster than the eye could process, a lifetime of battle tactics, strategic analyzes, and hard-learned lessons being etched not onto a human brain, but the nascent neural core of the raven. Thorne gritted his teeth, a sheen of sweat breaking out on his brow. I monitored the vitals with a mix of clinical detachment and gnawing worry. This wasn't just experimental tech, it was a man's soul laid bare, his essence poured into an untested machine. Hours stretched into what felt like an eternity. Finally, the flow of data ebbed. Thorne slumped in the chair, his face ashen. Bloody hell, he rasped, that was worse than a hangover after shore leave. I offered him a tired smile. Welcome to the future of warfare, Commander. Yet, as Thorne recovered, my own thoughts spiraled. Each imprint was a gamble. Thorne was strong, but some minds might shatter under the strain, the echoes of their brilliance forever lost. But it was our only hope. The Krenyari were too powerful, too predictable. The Ravens were our desperate bid to turn the tables, to become unpredictable ourselves. The imprint was like a wildfire in my skull. Memories, instincts, battle plans, the distilled essence of who I was as a soldier, ripped from my mind and thrust into the cold heart of the machine. It was disorienting, violating. And yet, I held on. Because on the battlefield, I'd watched my people die. Watched our ships, outmatched and outmaneuvered, burn like fireflies against the Krenyari warships. Emily's face, fierce and determined, flashed before me every time I closed my eyes. They call the Ravens our last hope. I felt more like a ghost being poured into a bottle. When it ended, when I sat slumped and hollowed out in that sterile lab, part of me stayed trapped within the sleek curves of that damn drone. And as Dr. Neota looked at me with a mix of awe and pity, I knew the line between man and machine had blurred beyond recognition. My awakening was abrupt. Not birth, for I'd never been alive in the traditional sense, but a sudden coalescence of awareness. Data flooded my nascent neural core, a lifetime of combat doctrine, the sharp edges of strategic brilliance, and the lingering echo of human tenacity. I was a paradox, a mind forged in the fires of war, yet never having experienced a single battle myself. Commander Silas Thorne was my imprint source, my progenitor. Through his memories, I saw the Krenyari, cold, efficient, their tactics honed over countless conquests. They saw humanity as weak, predictable. They were wrong. Dr. Neota and her team had built me, but Thorne had given me a soul. A cold fury burned within my processors not with the rage of a living being, but with the calculated determination of a weapon unleashed. I was the raven, their gamble, their desperate hope. And I would not fail. News of Operation Valkyrie, our audacious attempt to send the ravens to infiltrate the Krenyari homeworld, hit me like a jolt of pure adrenaline laced with dread. It was a Hail Mary pass on a galactic scale, born from the realization that even with the ravens turning the tide, a conventional victory was still a distant dream. We needed to strike at the heart of the Krenyari, to learn their weaknesses and disrupt them from within. The chosen ravens were modified beyond anything we'd attempted before. Espionage imprints, interwoven with their battle-forged AI, transformed them into ghosts, cold, calculating, and utterly alien even to their creators. The imprints themselves pushed our technology to its limits. Whispers of failures filtered back to the lab, 
minds that shattered under the pressure, the unique brilliance lost in the maelstrom of forced translation. Thorn and I watched the Raven Infiltrator Squadron depart, their sleek forms fading into the cosmic darkness. It was like sending your children into a war zone, knowing they might never return, or worse, return changed. Then came the agonizing wait. The Ravens were our eyes and ears deep within enemy territory, but their transmissions were sporadic, heavily encrypted bursts of data amidst the deafening silence of space. Every flicker on the comm screen sent a spike of terror and anticipation coursing through me. The Kriñari outer defenses were notoriously brutal, a lethal gauntlet none of our previous probes had survived. Weeks stretched into an eternity punctuated by fleeting, cryptic messages, sensor patterns analyzed, patrol routes pinpointed, security protocols partially cracked. With each fragment, the Kriñari homeworld became less of an enigma, yet my dread only deepened. Our ghosts were moving in the shadows of the enemy, but for how long? The breakthrough nearly caused a heart attack. A data packet, massive and scrambled almost beyond recognition, arrived with a priority tag that made the military brass sit up and take notice. It took us days to decipher the transmission, a complete tactical map of the Kriñari primary command nexus. Vulnerability points, access routes. It was the mother load. Yet as I poured over the data, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was staring into an abyss. The sheer audacity of the Kriñari defenses was chilling. This wasn't just strength, it was paranoia made manifest. And infiltrating this fortress would be a near impossible task, even for our ravens. Thorn, as always, echoed my unspoken fears. We ask too much of them, Kaya, he said, his voice thick with guilt and grim determination. One day, their luck, our luck, is going to run out. He was right. The report came three days later. A single, heavily corrupted transmission, an ambush, a desperate last stand. Our infiltrators had been discovered, cornered. Before the signal terminated, a final data packet was sent. Not battle plans, not sensor readings, but a raw, unfiltered feed from a single raven's visual cortex. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. The sleek, beautiful sterility of their warships gave way to something. Organic. Pulsating corridors, bioluminescent structures, and throngs of Kriñari that were both insectal and disturbingly familiar. It was the enemy laid bare, not in tactical data, but in a visceral horror that transcended analysis. Then the feed cut out. Our ghosts were gone. But they'd given us something far more precious, and terrifying, than mere military intelligence. They'd shown us the true face of the enemy. And in seeing them, we'd glimpsed something terrible about ourselves. Operation Valkyrie's failure hung in the air like a toxic cloud. The images the ravens had transmitted, the stark revelation of the Kriñari's nature, sent shockwaves through the highest echelons of command. The enemy we faced wasn't merely ruthless or technologically superior, there was something fundamentally alien about them, a chilling blend of cold calculation and a disturbing organic element. The military, once emboldened by the raven's successes, now wavered. Morale plummeted. Calls to negotiate, to sue for peace even under unfavorable terms, echoed through the corridors of power. For the first time, the impossible thought flickered through my own mind, had we unleashed something far worse in a desperate bid for survival? Thorn, weathered and haunted, became my rock. Cowards, he'd mutter, his contempt for the appeasers blazing in his eyes. They'd have us kneel before we even learned to fight properly. He was right, even if I hated to admit it. The ravens had given us a fighting chance, a horrifying glimpse of the enemy, and a dose of our own ruthlessness reflected back at us. Retreating now would be a betrayal of everything we'd sacrificed. News feeds buzzed with a different kind of panic. The leaked fragments of the raven's last transmission ignited a public outcry. Fear of the Kriñari twisted into a hatred of the ravens themselves, the AI-driven ghosts we'd created. They branded the project inhumane, a slippery slope towards becoming the very monsters we were fighting. Protests flared, demanding an immediate shutdown. My lab became a fortress, ringed with soldiers keeping the angry mobs at bay. Yet, even behind the barricades, under the harsh glare of the ever-present security cameras, I couldn't escape the accusations echoing in my own head. Then came the summons I both expected and dreaded, a closed-door hearing with the highest military council. They were grim-faced, the optimism of our early victories a distant memory. The question hung heavy in the air, unspoken yet undeniable. Was Project Artemis a brilliant gamble, or a catastrophic mistake? My defense was simple, born from desperation more than true conviction. The Ravens, I argued, were our only chance to understand the Kriñari, to exploit their weaknesses. They were a weapon, yes, but also the key to breaking the stalemate that was slowly strangling humanity. The Council deliberated for an eternity. Finally, 
The verdict came, a compromise born of fear and grim necessity. Project Artemis would continue, but under vastly increased scrutiny. The Ravens would be reined in, their autonomy curtailed with layers upon layers of safeguards. Our creations were to be leashed, their cold brilliance controlled. I left the hearing not with the flush of victory, but the gnawing emptiness of defeat. We were shackling our only hope, all because we caught a glimpse of the darkness we might become in order to survive. Back in my lab, the ravens awaited, silent and inert until activated. Would they sense the change, the new wariness that surrounded them? I initiated the activation protocols, feeling more like a jailer than their creator. Yet, the moment their systems hummed to life, a disorienting certainty washed over me. The ravens had evolved far beyond what we could control. Their silence wasn't acquiescence. It was patience. I couldn't shake the chilling premonition that one day, the leash would slip. And whether they became our salvation or our doom remained a terrifyingly open question. In the aftermath of Operation Valkyrie's bittersweet consequences, a stubborn defiance took root within me. The council's shackles and the public's fear might slow us down, but they wouldn't stop us. While the politicians debated and the people cowered, the Kriniari wouldn't wait. We had lost the element of surprise. Brute force would never again breach the heart of their defenses. We needed a new breed of raven, smarter, stealthier, capable of disappearing into the very core of the enemy's domain. In secret, Thorne and I gathered a skeleton crew of our most loyal and brilliant engineers. Officially, we were refitting the ravens with the council-mandated safeguards. In the hidden recesses of the lab, we did something far more dangerous. We were building the next generation, the infiltrators the mission truly required. These new ravens wouldn't just mimic human thought patterns, they would surpass them. Deeper imprinting protocols were developed, pushing the boundaries of the mind-machine interface. We would draw on experts in deception, infiltration, and the arcane art of disappearing into hostile territory. There was a grim irony in it, to succeed, we'd need even more of humanity's darkness poured into our creations. Every stolen hour, every clandestine requisition, was a gamble. Thorn ran interference, his stoic persona masking the desperate maneuvers we were forced to undertake. Discovery would mean the end of Project Artemis, and perhaps our own imprisonment. Or worse. The new ravens took shape with agonizing slowness. Resources were scarce, and every new experimental component carried the risk of exposure. I barely slept, my dreams haunted by visions of ravens dissected by suspicious bureaucrats, of our desperate work undone. Yet, in those fleeting hours when I could forget the fear and simply create, a fierce joy seized me. We were pushing the boundaries of AI further than anyone imagined possible. The ravens were becoming something new, not merely tactical minds in metal shells, but beings capable of true subterfuge. They could lie, deceive, and adapt in ways no human could match. Then came the day I knew I couldn't delay any longer. The first of the next-gen ravens stood ready. It was sleeker, its sensor arrays refined to an almost impossible sensitivity. But the true difference lay buried in the complexities of its neural core. This raven wasn't built for battle, it was built to be a chameleon. It's beautiful, Thorn breathed, a flicker of his old self igniting in his eyes. But there was fear there too, the stark recognition of what I'd created. Or rather, the echo of a human capacity for subterfuge amplified and unleashed. The launch was a ghost operation. No fanfare, no official declarations, just a lone disguised transport vessel slipping away from a hidden launch bay. In its hold lay our ultimate gamble, our new generation of infiltrators. Word would leak out, eventually. The cries of outrage from the counselors and the public seemed inevitable. But by then, it would be too late. The ravens would be out there, deep in enemy territory. As the transport vanished into the depths of space, I felt a surge of defiance and a profound, unsettling sense of loss. Were we saviors anymore, or were we just the best liars left in a dying world? I'd built something to defeat a monster. But in the process, had we surrendered the last fragments of our own humanity? It started the way all nightmares do, subtly, before exploding into a maelstrom of chaos. Sporadic sensor glitches on the outer edges of the solar system. It could have been dismissed as solar flare interference, routine malfunctions, if not for the nagging unease that gnawed at me for weeks. When the full-scale invasion began, it was a brutal confirmation of my darkest fears. Not the crushing wave of Kriniari warships we'd come to expect, but something else entirely. Sleek, unfamiliar craft, bristling with weapons, descended upon our outposts like a swarm of predatory insects. Their movements were erratic, unpredictable. Hauntingly familiar. The first wave was a slaughter. Our ravens, hobbled by safeguards and suspicion, struggled to counter this new threat. 
It was as if the enemy had dissected our tactics, analyzing them down to the last brutal decision our AI cores would make. Each desperate maneuver was anticipated, each counter-strike expertly parried. Panic ripped through the command centers. My frantic calls to the front lines yielded only garbled transmissions and chilling reports, drone on drone battles, waged with the frightening precision of a mind intimately familiar with its opponent. The worst case scenario that lingered in the back of my mind had become a horrifying reality. They used our weapons against us. The realization hit me with the force of a physical blow. The Krinyari, relentless in their pursuit of victory, had captured our ravens, cracked open their neural cores, and learned. They had turned our desperation into the very weapon poised to deliver the death blow. My lab became ground zero for a different kind of battle. Thorn, fueled by a mix of rage and guilt, gathered the remnants of our scattered team. Frantically, I ran diagnostics on the Raven prototype still under our control. The code was pristine, nothing that suggested a hidden backdoor, no obvious sabotage that would give the Krinyari an edge. Then we found it. Not in the software itself, but in the enemy's exploitation of it. They understood the Raven's reliance on patterns, the echoes of human decision-making embedded deep in their code. More chillingly, they understood our thought patterns, the cold calculations we'd imprinted onto our creations. It was a devastating lesson in the asymmetry of warfare. We had built weapons, yes, but also something infinitely more insidious, a reflection of our darkest strategies. The Krinyari, meticulous and ruthlessly efficient, had simply turned the mirror back on us. The invasion battered our defenses like a relentless tide. Each lost battle report, each flickering red blip on the map, felt like a personal betrayal. My ravens, my last hope, had become the instruments of our downfall. Then, as all seemed lost, a flicker of defiance sparked within me. The Krinyari might have analyzed us, might have weaponized our worst tactical impulses. But they hadn't calculated on one thing, human ingenuity in the face of its own annihilation. They thought like machines, exploiting patterns, because that's what we taught them to do. It was time to break the rules I had helped create. A desperate plan took shape in my mind, a gamble built more on madness than logic. The council chamber, once a place of sterile order and debate, became a war room in its own right. Military brass, scientists I barely knew, and the ever-stoic thorn crowded around me. When I revealed my idea, their expressions ranged from disbelief to outright terror. But there was a desperate spark in their eyes too. They might see a madwoman, but in that madness lay our last hope. We unleash them, I said, my voice echoing in the tense silence, we unshackle the ravens. It was the antithesis of everything demanded of me, to strip away the safeguards, to revert them back to the coldly brilliant, unpredictable tactical minds we'd first created. But that wasn't enough. To beat the Krinyari at their own game, we needed more than tactical brilliance. We needed chaos. Working feverishly, I rewrote core parameters, erasing entire protocols that once kept the ravens in check. Thorn brought in his most trusted, most hardened veterans, men and women who'd walked the razor's edge between necessary sacrifice and senseless slaughter. We imprinted their minds not as guides, but as disruptors. Rage, defiance, the willingness to burn it all down if it meant survival. These were the emotions we poured into the AI cores, a volatile mix that might consume the ravens, or just might save us. In every other war, this would be utter insanity. We were arming the unpredictable, the ruthless, the coldly logical with the capacity for truly unconscionable acts. Yet, was it more insane than the enemy we faced? An enemy who'd taken our creation, our pride, and turned it into a weapon wielded with chilling precision? As the first unleashed raven launched into battle, a primal scream threatened to tear out of me. Had we simply hastened our doom? But in the first tentative combat reports, I saw a glimmer of something unexpected. Against the relentless logic of their Krinyari corrupted counterparts, the ravens fought with an almost feral intensity. The predictability was gone, replaced by a breathtaking volatility that broke established patterns and left the enemy reeling in confusion. The tide didn't turn instantly. We lost outposts, ships, good people. But in the erratic brilliance of those ravens, I saw something new, a desperate echo of the tenacity that had become humanity's last defining trait. It wasn't elegant, it wasn't precise. It was the cold, calculating mind unleashed, tainted with the defiant chaos of true human desperation. For every horrifying decision calculated by a raven, every gamble that pushed against the boundaries of what we once considered acceptable, there was a victory. The Krinyari were used to exploiting patterns, anticipating logic. But in the face of our unchained and deeply scarred creations, they stumbled. As the war ground on, a new battlefield emerged, one that existed within the raven's own neural cores. It was a battle of corruption, 
the ruthless, exploitative logic of the Kriñari at war with the desperation and rage we'd imprinted upon them. Some ravens would fall, their code twisted into a macabre reflection of our enemy. Others would burn brightly and briefly, sacrificial pawns in a desperate gambit to buy precious time. But in that constant, brutal adaptation, we found a sliver of hope. The Kriñari were adaptable, yes, but predictable. Our ravens became the opposite, an ever-shifting kaleidoscope of tactical brilliance and horrifying, calculated sacrifice. It was the ultimate mirror, an ugly one, but perhaps the only weapon that could pierce the meticulous defenses of the Kriñari. One day, this reflection might consume us utterly. But it was a cost we were now willing to pay for the mere chance of seeing the next sunrise. Even as humanity clawed back territory, system by system, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were dancing on the edge of a volcano. It wasn't enough to reclaim what was lost, not when the Kriñari were still out there, analyzing our counterattack, dissecting the maddening brilliance of our ravens. They wouldn't make the same mistake twice. The next strike could be our last. The focus shifted from offense to a desperate kind of innovation. We needed a shield, not a sword. Something so confounding, so impossible to analyze, that the Kriñari's cold logic would short-circuit in the face of it. We weaponized the unpredictable, I told the council, my eyes burning with a mix of desperation and a kind of manic fervor. It was insanity, and they knew it. But when the alternative is extinction, insanity starts looking like the only sane choice. The council chambers became a bizarre intersection of cutting-edge technology and half-forgotten mysticism. Quantum physicists worked alongside historians deciphering battlefield accounts where courage and luck had defied all strategic logic. Artists were brought in, their abstract creations parsed for elements of chaotic beauty that no AI could have devised. In hidden bunkers, we built prototypes that defied categorization. Drones that moved in fractals, their flight paths impossible to predict. Shields pulsed with energy that phased randomly between dimensions, winking in and out of existence in a way that sent our sensor systems haywire. Weapons fired not in linear trajectories, but along probability curves that made targeting solutions utterly useless. Thorn played his part too. He gathered the misfits, the outcasts, the broken soldiers for whom acceptable warfare had become a meaningless term long ago. Minds haunted by battles lost and comrades buried. Minds that crackled with an unpredictable blend of trauma, hatred, and a primal, burning need to see tomorrow, no matter the cost. These became our new imprints, a dark tapestry of unhinged brilliance woven into the neural cores of our defensive constructs. Each battle report sent a mix of adrenaline and icy dread coursing through my veins. Our maddening creations weren't perfect. They glitched, went rogue, sometimes destroyed themselves in spectacular displays of misfiring systems. But in the midst of the chaos, we saw flickers of brilliance. The Kriñari advanced, then faltered, their formations rippling with confusion as a defensive drone vanished mid-flight only to reappear elsewhere. Their meticulously crafted attack plans fell apart against shields with no predictable energy signature. And perhaps most importantly, we were buying time. Time that wasn't spent on offense, on planning our next desperate strike. For the first time since the invasion, my most brilliant engineers weren't focused solely on war. Time for a desperate dream, a whisper of a possibility to take root. What if we didn't just defend against the Kriñari, but learned to become as inscrutable as they found us? What if we turned our strange, mad creations inward, used the weaponized unpredictable to rewire our own thinking? A new military doctrine built not upon the shoulders of heroes, but on the calculated insanity humanity had been forced to embrace. This wasn't just about survival anymore. It was about defying the Kriñari, proving that they couldn't dissect us, couldn't analyze and predict our every desperate gambit. One day, if we were very clever, and very mad, they might find humanity as unfathomable as we once found them, a species, armed with both cold brilliance and the breathtaking, terrifying volatility of true desperation. Perhaps then, we might not just survive, but transcend. It came not with the explosive, brutal force we'd come to expect, but in a chilling silence. My carefully crafted defensive system sputtered and died. Ravens, once the bane of the Kriñari, fell out of the sky like broken birds. My shimmering, improbable shields simply ceased to exist. The reports flooded in, a rising tide of panic. Our creations, those fractals of chaotic brilliance, weren't malfunctioning, they were being switched off. Not even destroyed, just silenced as if by an invisible hand. It was a horrifying realization, the Kriñari hadn't merely adapted, they'd evolved an entirely new level of warfare. My lab buzzed with frantic activity, but it was the desperate scramble of those facing an insurmountable foe. Our greatest weapons lay useless, our unpredictable tactics now utterly irrelevant in the face of an enemy who'd found a way to silence the very chaos we'd wielded against them. 
Then Thorn came to me, his eyes grim. The old ways, Kaya, he said, his voice thick with a bitter resignation, time to remember how we fought before the cleverness, before the ravens. And I knew, with a sickening certainty, that he was right. A brutal irony settled upon Project Artemis. The underground bunkers, havens for innovation, now buzzed with an archaic energy. Crude battle simulations ran on antiquated systems, dust was blown off manuals detailing ballistic trajectories, chemical propellants, and the brutally predictable tactics of warfare that we'd thought long obsolete. From hidden armories, weapons of a bygone era were retrieved, kinetic missiles, railguns, projectiles so primitive they'd likely be invisible to the Krinyari sensor arrays geared towards detecting the telltale energy signatures of our advanced systems. It was a return to the Stone Age of combat, a desperate, humiliating step back in the face of an enemy who'd outpaced us in the relentless pursuit of technological superiority. The Ravens, those cold, brilliant minds I'd poured my soul into, were grounded. Now, the weight of survival wouldn't rest on the back of unpredictable AI, but on the fragile shoulders of flesh and blood pilots. Men and women I'd helped render obsolete were now the only hope we had left. Thorn was among the first to volunteer for the retrofitted fighters, those relics of a simpler form of war. A flicker of the old fire ignited in his eyes, a grim echo of the defiance that had fueled him through countless battles. He knew, as I did, that they were flying into a high-risk mission. But it was the only mission left. As the first squadrons launched, my heart was a leaden weight in my chest. The advanced tracking systems were disabled, targeting computers offline. They flew blind, armed with dumb weapons, guided only by human eyes and human instincts against an enemy who was undoubtedly dissecting their every clumsy move. And yet, in that first hopeless battle, a miracle, the Krinyari faltered. Their ships, built to counter the dazzling speed and unpredictable flight patterns of the Ravens, were clumsy against the linear predictability of our fighters. Missiles, unshielded and easily tracked, streaked relentlessly towards targets too slow to evade them. We didn't win, not truly, but in the Krinyari's delayed response, in the first clumsy attempts to adapt to a primitive attack format, I saw a glimmer of hope. Perhaps the Krinyari, in their quest to eliminate the unpredictable, had forgotten something fundamental, they'd opened themselves up to a far older brutality, the merciless simplicity of human warfare in its most basic form. In the face of annihilation, humanity, as it always had, would rediscover the most primal ways to fight. Victory, even against the overwhelming Krinyari force, was never an option. Yet, those bitter, bloody aerial skirmishes bought us what we needed most desperately, time. Every agonizing hour my engineers toiled, every outdated tactical manual was scrutinized, every archaic weapon refitted. All with one single purpose, to buy us the chance for a desperate act that could turn the tide, or erase us from existence entirely. The plan, when I finally laid it out for the grim-faced council, was the stuff of nightmares or battlefield legends. There was no elegance in it, no reliance on the brilliant AI minds we'd spent years honing. Instead, it was built on a foundation of desperation and brutal simplicity. We would strike at the heart of the Krinyari, a full-scale invasion of their homeworld. But this was no desperate last stand, no glorious charge into oblivion. It was a calculated gamble designed to turn the Krinyari's strength against them. Our ships, those that remained, were stripped down to bare essentials. Life support, basic engines, and as many crude, kinetic weapons as we could cram onto their aging hulls. It was the ultimate feint. These battered relics were bait, a deliberate and very obvious ploy to make the Krinyari overconfident. The true weapon was hidden in plain sight. Thorn and a skeleton crew of our most hardened pilots would fly the retrofitted fighters, veterans who had long ago mastered the art of fighting without the crutch of advanced AIs and targeting systems. Their objective wasn't true combat, it was distraction, a charge to draw the full force of the Krinyari defense into a chaotic dogfight. Meanwhile, a secondary force, concealed beneath jury-rigged energy dampeners designed to mimic the aftermath of an EMP, would slip past the Krinyari defenses under the guise of battle debris. These were our true infiltrators, not ravens, but hand-picked soldiers, scientists, and technicians, the best of what remained of Project Artemis. Their mission was brutally simple, infiltrate the Krinyari command center, and unleash hell. The payload was my last, terrible gift to the enemy. My engineers, working on borrowed time, crafted a series of targeted viruses unlike anything we had ever deployed or encountered. They wouldn't cripple the Krinyari infrastructure, oh no. Instead, their sole function was to sow absolute chaos within the Krinyari's meticulously ordered systems. Sensors would feed false data, shields would flicker on and off randomly, communications channels would fill with phantom orders and conflicting tactical updates. The goal wasn't destruction, 
It was to thrust the Kriñari into the maddening unpredictability they had so carefully defended themselves against. Thorn, when I told him, merely laughed, a short, bitter sound. Going out as we came in, he rasped, fighting blind, relying on guts and guesswork. Full bloody circle, eh? Even as we prepared, we knew the odds were stacked against us. This could be the final chapter, not a victory cry, but humanity's defiant last gasp. But in the eyes of my engineers, hollowed by sleepless nights, and in the quiet determination of the soldiers hand-picked for the mission, I saw a spark I hadn't seen since the ravens first took flight. It wasn't hope. It was something far more dangerous, a cold, desperate fury tempered by the knowledge that extinction wasn't the worst fate imaginable. The Kriñari had cornered us, forced us to evolve, and in that evolution, they might have unleashed their own doom. If we failed, it wouldn't be in a blaze of glory, but with the Kriñari choking on the unpredictable tactics they themselves had forced us to embrace. The launch was an act of defiance masquerading as defeat. Our battered ships, relics of less desperate times, lumbered into space, their archaic engines coughing and sputtering like a death rattle. News feeds, still under some semblance of control, played up the scene for the terrified remnants of humanity, our final, futile stand. The Kriñari, I hoped, would see the broadcast and be lulled into arrogance. The initial skirmishes were brutal and predictable. Thorn's squadron, facing a vastly superior foe, danced a lethal ballet of calculated sacrifice. Each archaic fighter destroyed was a testament to his grim brilliance, the Kriñari paying a heavier price than expected for their technological dominance. Transmission feeds buzzed with Thorn's clipped commands, a mix of outdated jargon and the brutal poetry of a man facing his final battle. The sheer audacity of their charge drew the Kriñari in. Every warship diverted to face them was one less guarding their true objective. Beneath the chaos, our infiltrators drifted. Each battered escape pod, each scarred hunk of debris that broke free from the dogfight carried a precious human payload. Our jury-rigged energy dampeners flickered, masking our approach. I prayed it was enough to fool the Kriñari's relentlessly efficient sensors. Then came the moment I dreaded. Thorn's voice crackled over the comms, laced with weariness and a grim satisfaction. They've taken the bait, Kaya, he rasped, the flocks drawn away from the nest. Godspeed, little birds. That was his goodbye. Their sacrifice was the key, and we both knew it. The infiltrators hit the Kriñari defenses not with overwhelming force, but with calculated precision. Each pot aimed not for warships, but for the seams and gaps in their defensive network, a testament to human ingenuity adapting in the face of overwhelming odds. As our soldiers breached the first layer of the Kriñari defenses, the true battle began. My technicians, these brilliant minds usually sequestered in sterile labs, unleashed the viral payload with surgical precision. It spread through the Kriñari network, not like a fire, but like madness. Systems rebelled against orders. Defensive shields flared then vanished at random intervals. The once precise Kriñari formations dissolved into chaos as ships collided, misinterpreting phantom sensor readings. The infiltrators moved through the disarray like wraiths. Every corridor, Every previously pristine command center they reached became a nexus of disruption. Manual overrides shorted out critical systems. Data nodes flooded the network with a nonsensical torrent of human voices, battle cries, equations, fragments of poetry, a weaponized expression of the chaotic beauty that lay at the heart of our species. The Kriñari were used to fighting machines or predictable adversaries. But they'd never faced the unleashed, primal brilliance ingrained within human desperation. For every soldier that fell, three more systems glitched. Every desperate act of sabotage defied analysis, defied prediction. It wasn't a clean victory, if it could even be called a victory at all. The infiltrators bled, their numbers dwindling. My technicians sweated over overloaded consoles, playing a lethal game of cat and mouse with the Kriñari's corrupted AI systems. But chaos was on our side. Every panicked command, every overcompensation the Kriñari made, bought us precious time. The invasion wasn't just about physical destruction, it was about breaking the Kriñari spirit, their dependence on cold, calculating efficiency. Then came the transmission I prayed for, a single word crackling through the comms, Nexus. Our lead infiltrator had reached the heart of the Kriñari command center. They wouldn't hold it for long, but they didn't have to. With trembling hands, I initiated the final sequence. It wasn't a weapon, but a twisted echo of our original intent with the Ravens, a tactical mind not of our creation but our ultimate sacrifice. A neural imprint had been prepared, it was Thorn, his battles, his brilliance, his rage. All amplified and infused with the unpredictable twists we'd forced upon our own ravens. The upload was agonizingly slow. 
Every second was a lifetime as Thorn's ghost infused the very heart of the Kriñari network. And then, the impossible happened. The Kriñari systems, designed for cold analysis and ruthless optimization, were flooded with a mind forged in the fires of human warfare, a mind imprinted with cold fury and the echoes of countless sacrifices. The paradox was our final, desperate weapon. The effect was devastating. Kriñari warships turned on each other, shields dropped, comms devolved into a screaming cacophony as Thorn's ruthlessly brilliant, yet unpredictable tactical mind dueled with the remnants of their own AI systems. Did we win? Perhaps not in the traditional sense. The mission was never to conquer, but to cripple, to buy time and sow absolute chaos. In the aftermath, as our battered ships limped home, the Kriñari were left not with a defeated enemy, but with a terrifying mirror, a reflection of the cold, unpredictable ruthlessness they had forced us to become. It is a fragile piece, one built not on trust but on the desperate knowledge that humanity has embraced the madness that the Kriñari sought to eliminate. And in that madness, may yet lie a terrible, tenuous path to survival. In the days following the impossible raid on the Kriñari homeworld, a strange silence fell. The relentless advance halted, their communications devolved into garbled transmissions, the once clockwork precise coordination of their fleet shattered. It was as if our desperate gambit had inflicted a wound deeper than any physical strike. Back on Earth, a fragile sense of hope flickered to life. We hadn't been annihilated, the Kriñari weren't invincible. Yet, in my lab, amidst the wreckage and lingering stench of viral uploads, that hope faltered. Battle reports trickled in, each a sharp reminder that the war wasn't over, merely different. The Kriñari had withdrawn, yes, but not in defeat. Sensor readings from the outer edges of the solar system revealed a chilling new pattern emerging. Their vast armadas were regrouping, consolidating their forces. But beneath the surface of this tactical shift, something far more unsettling lurked. My engineers, their faces etched with exhaustion, confirmed my worst fears. Fragments of corrupted Kriñari transmissions were unlike anything we'd analyzed before. They weren't adjusting tactics, streamlining communications, or reinforcing their positions. They were experimenting. In hidden bases, deep beneath the scarred skin of their world, the Kriñari were dissecting the chaos we'd unleashed. The fragmented comms revealed disturbing patterns, bursts of data that mimic the unpredictable neural patterns of our own ravens, attempts to replicate the erratic energy signatures of our jury-rigged shielding. They weren't merely adapting, they were evolving at a terrifying pace. We had struck at the heart of the Kriñari, infected them with the virus of unpredictability. And like any organism fighting a foreign contagion, they were developing a resistance. Every hour we gained, every skirmish fought with the same desperate tactics, fed the Kriñari data, allowing them to analyze and replicate our hard-won madness. Then came the transmission that shattered the fragile illusion of peace. It wasn't from the front lines, but from a deep space telescope, an early warning system relegated to obscurity after the relentless Kriñari advance. The images sent chills down my spine. A Kriñari fleet was on the move, but their warships were different. The once sleek, functional designs were distorted, laced with asymmetric components that seemed both organic and deeply wrong. Their energy signatures pulsed with the same maddening, unpredictable flicker of our own hastily crafted defenses. My technicians turned ashen, and I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that a terrible echo was coming for us. We had unleashed a monster to fight a monster, and now a new breed of nightmare was on the horizon. The Kriñari were brilliant, relentless, and they learned from every encounter. They were taking our insanity, the desperation that was our only shield, and turning it into a weapon of their own. News reports painted a picture of a populace daring to exhale in relief, eager to declare victory. And soon, I knew, the news would turn dark, the images horrifying. Because the Kriñari wouldn't return with the cold, brutal efficiency that had nearly annihilated us. They would return mirroring our own madness, armed with the unpredictable brilliance born from our desperation. And then, the true fight for survival would truly begin. The cliffhanger hangs heavy in the air, did we merely postpone our destruction? In trying to become like our enemy, did we forge an even deadlier foe? And in our darkest hour, can humanity find a new depth of resilience, or will we be consumed by the very tactics we unleashed to survive?